Hello, everybody. Uh, I was told uh, we can start, which is great. And so if you're interested in this session about GNOME, and uh, especially GNOME 3, then I welcome you to join us uh, here uh, on the stage, respectively, in the audience. So please come forward and take a seat. I'm uh, Toby. I'm one of the, the people involved in the GNOME project. And today, I want to present the, say, history of GNOME 3. GNOME 3 is our, well, uh, newest release of a desktop system. And we've, well, we've received, say, uh, criticisms or critiques over the last few five years, especially in the beginning. And I want to show you how we've sort of reacted and what our story is regarding, say, change. So I will present first a slight overview of GNOME or GNOME 3. And then I will eventually lead to examples of the way we've evolved GNOME and what we've changed in order to accommodate Request And I will finish by inviting you all to take part in the development of a great free software desktop system. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be inspired to, well, join the community and also give feedback and also make change happen. So the first question you might ask is, well, what is this GNOME stuff, right? So what are you talking about in the first place? And then you might ask the question, well, what is, what is this GNOME 3 thing you're talking about? And what does all this uh, have to do with the 3.0 that everybody has uh, pretty much, say, uh, uh, criticized uh, negatively? And then what have you finally done for 3.20? So let me, let me ask you guys what do you think GNOME is. Does anybody have an idea of, well, what the, what the name GNOME actually contains, say, what it, what it entails. Who has an idea? Who, who dares to say what he or she thinks GNOME is? Oh, can you repeat? An igno? I didn't get that, but it seems to be funny. So <laughs> oh, there, there's a mic coming, so you can uh, embarrass yourself uh, to the internet. I just said it's a KDE clone. Ah, <laughs> all right, all right. A KDE clone. Right. Fair enough. So let's uh, generalize that to a, say, desktop system for people to use. Let's say, uh, let's generalize that to widgets and windows and applications for people to start. And let's generalize that to something that you see when you boot your computer and, uh, well, where you then, say, take actions on. Any, any other taker and any other uh, volunteer wanting to, to tell us the idea of, uh, of what GNOME is or could be. Ah, an expert. <laughs> oh, technical difficulties with the mic. OK. Yeah, I, I thought you were asking what GNOME means. Uh-huh. Well, that, that, I, will, I will come to that later, yes. But please, go ahead. So if. If we want to know what GNOME means, I think we should, we should remember the first G means GNU. Absolutely. Then there is something about network, uh -huh. about object. Environment, I don't remember the M. <laughs> model. GNU network model object environment, indeed. So um, that, that's absolutely true. The first letter in GNOME is a G, and the G is for GNU, and the GNU is for freedom. So GNOME is also about free software, right? And GNU is about delivering software to people, or to as many people as possible to, well, to enable them to do their free computing, or to do their computing with free software. So we really, well, want to, to do free software and deliver it to, to as many people as possible. That also includes to enable uh, or enabling as many people as possible also includes uh, making it accessible for the people. That includes things like translations or things like uh, alternative input methods for people who, well, uh, are not, say, able to use the commonly used input devices. So we try to, well, 
say, uh, free as many people as possible by, by providing them with a, with a great free and usable desktop system. Gnome is also a community. Gnome is about people. So um, depending on, on the, on the uh, say, busyness of the release, we have roughly 800, between 600 and 800 people working on, on any Gnome release. So these, this is a, say, rather big number of people who you could interact with if you're, if you're inclined to do so. Gnome could also host your, your project, right? We have uh, infrastructure like a bug tracker, like a wiki, and uh, like um, IRC servers and all. And there's, there's projects who want to be under the GNOME umbrella because they appreciate the fact that we have, well, a somewhat working state of, say, a software which, which enables projects to, to grow and mature. So GNOME is, of course, that desktop, desktop system that you, that you see when you boot up your computer, but GNOME is a bit bigger than that. Right. GNOME is also that, that community that you can interact with and that you can, uh, well, you say use to, to produce your free software and to, to enable more people to do free computing. So, the GNOME, let, let, let me answer the question what GNOME 3 is or what, what people hopefully think what GNOME 3 is. I claim that GNOME 3 is, or when, when people first see a, a GNOME system, a GNOME session, then I, I claim that people first see elegant design. Elegant in the sense that it's, it tries to be minimal, it tries to not interfere with your actual task at hand. Because we believe, we deeply believe, believe that you uh, don't sit in front of your computer because you like sitting in front of your computer, but you will sit there because you want to get stuff done. You have a task, you want to do something. So we try to not interfere with your task at hand, and we try to enable you to do well, your task as quickly and as efficiently as possible. That includes stuff like uh, reducing visual noise, stuff uh, that you don't necessarily, or that we think you don't necessarily need for performing your task. So I claim this is uh, what users, or what people will notice if they, if they first, say, see a GNOME 3 session. Eventually, when people interact with the system, they will come across what we call the activities overview. The activities overview gives you an, an insight of what your system is doing, like what, what you, what, in what state your system is in, and uh, you can alter that state by opening applications here on, on the left in that dock, or you can, uh, say, uh, switch the applications that are running by, by choosing them. So this is, uh, people will, will uh, come across this relatively, relatively quickly when they interact with the, with the system. Eventually, if you're, performing any task in the, with a GNOME, GNOME system, you will realize uh, that, you, that you get notifications uh, sooner or later. And these notifications have been redone a few times uh, within the GNOME, or within the recent GNOME releases. And we tried hard, or, and we're still trying, to make it as less intrusive as possible. Especially, we're trying to not have, say, uh, things like prompts. Right, like modal prompts, modal dialogues, which force you to, uh, well, context switch to that prompt and, uh, and then make, make a decision while, while you're not necessarily prepared for doing that. So we, we try to, to uh, have a nice story around the whole notification uh, and interrupting thing. We try, to not, we try to be smart about when to interrupt you and when, when to not to. And these uh, notifications, depending on, on the type, can also be interacted with so that the, the uh, say, amount of disruption or the, say, time needed to deal with the interruption can be, well, minimized. This includes things like uh, notifications that you can type into, right? So if you have a, uh, a chat client, uh, then you could uh, directly respond to, to someone asking whether you're ready for lunch or something like that. If you are working, or if you have been working for some time, then you might, may have created some content and you may have, uh, well, say, uh, objects in general in your system that you want to find back or that you want to uh, work with again. And then you can type whatever you want in the, in the search bar and these items that will then show up uh, will hopefully reflect what you've typed into in first place. And this, uh, this system is extensible, so there's few extensions that 
well, can react to your, to your query. In this case, we see the calculator responding to, to the thing that you've typed in. And this is, all of this is not revolutionary or, 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 or any, I don't know, this is not necessarily rocket science, right? It's just uh, assembled, or hopefully in a, assembled in a way that makes your computing easier and more efficient. Oh, by the way, if there's anything uh, that you either don't understand or have a, have a question on, then just uh, please show hands and make yourself heard. If, uh, if I don't react like quickly in time, then it's not that I don't like you, it's just that I don't see you, so please... Uh, uh, speak up and uh, make yourself heard if you have any any comment or question or want to want to discuss anything. So this is um, the stuff that you see or that I claim that that uh, people see when they interact with a GNOME system. But there's much more to a modern GNOME 3 system and. Uh, I've mentioned already that we try to enable as many people as possible to do computing with free software. And uh, this includes also that we have an extensive help system which we base around topics rather than from, from front to back. So traditionally, these help systems have had a linear story of, uh, well, starting from, from start to end, right, from start to finish. And uh, we've redesigned, we've remodeled the help in a way that it tries to answer common questions that you may have uh, about any program uh, at hand. And, um, well, there's just too much to, uh, to show what, what, the, what an actual GNOME 3 system uh, is, uh, is composed of or what, what, its, uh, what its features are. But I hope you believe me that we try hard with, uh, also with many tiny things to make your computing uh, as efficient as possible. And um, this is GNOME 3 in general, right? So this is um, what, what has always been the story behind GNOME 3. And these things haven't, uh, at the core, haven't significantly changed. We've always tried to be very uh, intuitive to use in general. And uh, uh, over, over the releases, we try to uh, refine the actual experience and we try to make it, well, we try to adapt to, to changes and requests. And we try to incorporate the feedback we get to make a, well, even better version for the next release. So we've eventually came up with the uh, GNOME Gothenburg release uh, a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago, and uh, while doing the release, we've also had some marketing around that, and I will hopefully show you the marketing video attached to that release, which will also highlight some features of the most recent release. Let's see whether it works. I have audio, hopefully. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. As a result, a dozen of GNOME's applications come with new features and a more attractive interface. GNOME Photos can crop your photos and apply filters to them. The control center has a revamped mouse panel. Software provides a seamless integration of sandboxed applications and OS upgrades. And furthermore, most applications now come with a keyboard shortcut window. Developers can look forward to an improved GNOME Builder which now comes with XTG app building and project templates. GTK has stabilized its theming support with the move to CSS elements. GNOME 320 will be provided by many distributions soon. The GNOME community is friendly and open for anyone. Build a better desktop with us by getting involved today. Right, this, is, uh, this has been done by a very talented uh, young Danish hacker, 
and uh, he he's been doing these release videos for for a few uh, few releases now, and I think they they only get better over time. So uh, kudos kudos to uh, to Bastian for creating that video, and also kudos to the to the technic, uh, technical team here that it just works so flawlessly. It's uh, actually one of the the first times where I can just plug in all the cables and then it just works, including the audio. So uh, very well done. So um, now we've seen what the what the say uh, latest. Known release, uh, well, looks like, and what it, what is, uh, what is it being made, made up of? Then you may ask, well, that's cool. How do you actually arrive at doing that, right? So how, how are you able to, to deliver such a, such a product? What are your, say, uh, technologies used, and, and how do you actually do that? So we, what we do is we have our core libraries, which, uh, well, I claim are quite mature. They have been around for, for 10, 15 years. And I claim that the GNOME project also has experience developing and designing uh, libraries. So we have this platform which we use to assemble all of this. And this platform you could also use from, uh, from your pretty much your favorite language because we have a technology which we call G-Object Introspection which allows for bindings to be automatically generated from, from our code. So you can actually use all of the GNOME libraries from, well, pretty much any language you, you can imagine, including things like Python or JavaScript. Turns out that a lot, lot of code nowadays in GNOME is, at least a user-facing code, is JavaScript. Because, uh, well, the idea revolved around the, the fact that JavaScript is relatively popular. So we, we thought that it would make sense to tap into the pool of JavaScript developers, uh, well, to, to make it more attractive to, to hack on GNOME stuff. We've also, uh, well, as, as uh, some application developers of you might be aware, we have uh, CSS theming, which, uh, well, once uh, it's a stable interface, you can use to, uh, well, uh, theme your application and make it look the way you want it. So this is um, how we've done, say, GNOME 3 and GNOME 3.20. But this is, uh, this shall be about history, right? So the, uh, you may very well ask, how has the GNOME 3 stuff started in the first place? And it's a very good question. And uh, it might be, be interesting to know that the whole idea is not particularly young. We have been working on the idea and uh, on making it happen since 2008. And uh, this is where, where it was first presented, where the idea was first presented and discussed. And that means that even before that, uh, there have been people thinking about this. So in 2008, at our annual conference, the Guadec, which will this year happen in Germany. So if you uh, live close by, I invite you to come to Karlsruhe this year in, in August, mid of August and uh, join the GNOME people having the conference. GWADIC stands for GNOME Users and Developers Conference. So it, uh, it tries to be an inclusive event. So if you are, say, uh, uh, a user with, uh, with not, say, uh, who does not necessarily develop GNOME applications, then that's fine. It's still fine to come to GWADIC because it's, it's also about the general ecosystem around GNOME. So uh, that does include users. So please come to Guadalajara this year in, as I've said, Karlsruhe in uh, mid of August. And who knows, maybe, you know, the, there will be an idea about uh, how the next generation of desktop systems should look like at this year's Guadalajara. And you might be, you might very well uh, be able to be there and to, to influence that decision. So this proposal was eventually followed up by people trying to make it happen at a hackfest. And uh, this hackfest was, uh, has then been followed by, by mockups because people were, of course, uh, trying to, to imagine what that new generation should look like. And so they've, they've uh, done wireframes and they've spent a long time and energy and sweat and blood into uh, coming up with, uh, with a mockup. So they've done this. Ha ha ha, now you're supposed to laugh because it's, a, it's an old screenshot from the GNOME 1 era. This is uh, what GNOME looked like uh, probably 15 years back or so. I actually forgot the exact release. Uh, it should be 1.10 or something, I don't know. So this is uh, what GNOME looked like in the back, uh, back in time. And you also realize that the logo is, has been, had been different back in the day from the current GNOME logo. So this is, uh, of course, not what they came up with. 
And this is also not what they came up with. This is uh, just to remind you how GNOME looked like, uh, well, before 2011, right? Because we've, uh, we've been with GNOME 3 for, for five years now, and I realize that some of you might not necessarily have ever seen the old traditional uh, GNOME 2 system. So this is what, what a traditional GNOME desktop looked like. It tried to resemble the Windows stuff to some extent, because this is what, well, was or still is popular, and many of their, their paradigms were, say, copied or, or resembled. So you see this uh, computer thing that you, you have, in general, you have the, the idea, the narrative of the desktop, right? So the, your screen tried to resemble what your physical desktop, like your actual table, looked like. And, well, the only reason this was done, arguably, was because it was popular, not necessarily because it made sense. It was, so the, the argument goes that this is what, what a company in Redmond thought would be good, but it might not actually be what is good. So the mockups then led to something like this. This is uh, one of the, the early mockups of uh, the GNOME 3 system from 2000, uh, should be end of 2008, maybe it was early 2009, when, well, the idea was uh, to code something like this, right? This is uh, what, what someone had drawn with a GIMP or something, and uh, this was the idea how it should look. But people were also quick to do an actual implementation. So only a couple of weeks later, there was actual code looking like this. So this is pretty much uh, what we've seen on the, on the mock-up, right? So this already showed how flexible or how versatile the platform libraries are to, to pretty much change the, the whole experience, the whole way you, you'd interact with, with your machine. So this was initial code. And uh, we had the idea, we knew what it should look like, and we almost have a product, right? We have running code. It's, uh, you could, and nowadays it would, it would probably be called the minimal, minimal viable product. So as soon as it builds, you could ship. But what do you ship? You don't have a name yet, right? We only knew that it should be the next generation system. So what would we actually, you know, deliver? What, what would we call it? There was, uh, there had been a sort of a, not, not a race, but, uh, some ideas were floating around. And the first idea was actually GNOME Shell. Other ideas included GNOME SH or GNOME CC, but the, the initial idea had never been contested since. So this is actually the, uh, that's the whole story about, about the name. That was, uh, this story is not very fancy, right? But, uh, yeah, this is, uh, how it, how it went. It was, uh, in a blog post, I think, that someone proposed to just, well, name it GNOME Shell. Okay, let's, let's, uh, see where we at. We have the, uh, we, have, we have the idea of what we want to achieve. We actually have some, some running code. We have a name. We just needed a brand, right? We, we needed to, to create some buzz around it. We, we wanted to con convince people to, to have a look at that new system. We wanted to make them feel good about what they, what they are going to receive. So we came up with uh, made of easy. That was the claim, as these marketing people say. Interestingly enough, we've never uh, followed that claim very much. We had a few screenshots. We actually, I even have a t-shirt with that, with that claim still. But we've never really followed that, say, or to keep that claim for long. We've, we've dropped, uh, the whole claim story anyway. And now it's, uh, it's just, just been GNOME 3. But the, I mean, even back in the day, the, it was always about making it easy, making, making it accessible, making it possible for as many people as possible to do computing. So that's why we, we thought that, well, GNOME would be made of easy. But I, I can understand that this, uh, that this claim has not been kept because it's, it doesn't translate very well, right? Uh, if you think about German, uh, my mother tongue is German, I, I wouldn't know how to properly translate made of easy into German, and I guess it's, uh, it's similar for, for other languages. And uh, that makes it complicated, or would have made it complicated for GNOME to keep that claim, because, well, most of GNOME software is, 
is very well translated, at least into, into the popular languages. And I think the whole translation story within GNOME is, uh, is a rather big success. So we have many, many very well translated modules, and the translation teams are very, uh, are working very hard to, to keep it, to keep it that way. So we've dropped the whole, the whole, uh, make it easy stuff, but we've had, uh, we've had other, other marketing, uh, stories around, around the new GNOME, uh, around the new GNOME release. One thing is, uh, actually, the idea with the videos. We had one person who, I don't know how, how long it took him to produce all these videos, but he produced uh, like a dozen videos where he explained what the new GNOME system is all about and, and uh, uh, how it looks like and what you can do with it. And that was, that was amazing. Let me show you one of those videos. We have sound again. We should have at least. Can the sound person... Can you... Because we've made it easier. Right, let me uh, restart that thing. Hi, I'm Jason Clinton, and I'm one of the hundreds who worked on GNOME 3. GNOME 3 is better because we've made it easier for you to work with your windows. To make a window fill the whole screen in GNOME 3, all you have to do is drag the title bar to the top of the screen. To return the window to its previous size, just hold the top of the window and drag it down. We have also added new ways of working with Windows to GNOME which will help you work more effectively. With GNOME 3 you can snap a window so that it fills half the screen. This is really useful because you can use it to easily view two windows side by side. Again, the window can be returned to normal by dragging it away from the side of the screen. This is one of the many ways that we've made GNOME 3 better. I also like the, the song, and you can imagine uh, a couple of years back when this was still young and fresh, and we were at Fosdem, and we had like a booth, like a table, right? And we, we showed GNOME 3, the new GNOME 3 release, to the people, and these videos were running in a loop, and uh, when you stand there at the booth and you hear that, that song for like 10, 12 hours, then uh, you get the hang of it. So uh, I want to make you feel the same way, so I'm showing one more video with that theme. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jason Clinton, and I'm one of the hundreds who worked on GNOME 3. One of the best features of GNOME 3 is a change in the way in which notifications are managed, allowing you to work more efficiently and with fewer interruptions. One example is instant messages. In GNOME 3, you are able to immediately see who has messaged you and the first line of their message at the bottom of your screen for a few seconds, allowing you to decide whether you would like to break your concentration. If you decide to reply, you can do so immediately without having to open the instant messenger. This is one of the many ways that we've made GNOME 3 better. Right, so this, uh, this uh, is concerned about all the marketing involved in the actual release. And uh, um, this was to lead to, to build up excitement about the new stuff, right? Because uh, change is hard for people, so you need to sort of uh, uh, make them embrace the new the new stuff, and we tried to to do that with with all the say uh, marketing involvement around around the new uh, release or the upcoming release. Eventually, the uh, uh, the uh, the day of release would come, right? I mean, uh, we're building up all that excitement, and and eventually need to to press uh, and to hit enter and and upload the the tarballs, the release tarballs. And at that stage, we had organized the release uh, along with parties. So we have had things produced like these balloons and shirts and uh, whatnot and shipped that around the world for people to, well, enjoy the, the release date. So we had, uh, I think, 100 something parties, 150 parties or so, all around the world. This is in, in, in Jordan. I didn't even know that we have people using GNOME in, in Jordan or, uh, or other countries in the Middle East. And I'm, I'm very excited to see that they, well, take the time and, and the energy to organize an event and to well, bring people together to, to collectively care about free software. So that was great. And I think uh, ever since, I, I haven't seen as much, uh, well, energy uh, targeted or focused at GNOME uh, since then. So we had these uh, 
these 50 countries, uh, which or we had, we, had, we had these parties organized in 50 countries, which I think is quite good. We also had uh, our Asian friends produce marketing material and ship it around the world to, well, only to, for, for other people to enjoy the GNOME release. So I think this is, um, this is very, uh, this is very good and very inspiring and very positive to see that there's so many people caring about free software and caring about GNOME in particular. So that's, um, that was really, really good. And, uh, I, I really hope that if we ever do a next major release, then we can concentrate again so much energy to, to embrace the, the, uh, the new free software product that we have. Of course, uh, this was five years back, right? And even then, or not necessarily even then, but of course then, particularly then when, when we did the big, say, release, uh, people, not all people were happy. Let's put it that way. So I claim that the, the new, say, change, you know, you've, you've seen the GNOME 2 screenshot, the, say, more traditional way things looked, and you've seen the more recent way things look. And this, it's absolutely clear, it has always been clear, that this does not please each and every one. However, the, the calculation had been, and still is, that the net effect of people is still uh, positive in the sense that we tap more uh, tap into a user base which we have not tapped into yet so that they will get used to the uh, computing, to the free computing, uh, much more easy. So people weren't happy, so we needed to come up with, well, making them happy again, right? And one of these ways is, or are the extensions. So GNOME eventually built an extension uh, I wouldn't call it a system. So let's call it a, a, it's capable of being extended by plugins. And uh, there has been a, a website put up uh, a couple of years ago already. And you can point your browser to that website and it would integrate the website into your desktop so you could click on the website just with the click of a button. It would download and install the plugin and run it. And you could configure and, uh, or, or un uninstall that plugin also from that very website. That was, uh, Back in the day, I, I really enjoyed the, the integration of the web or that, that extensions page into the desktop. So that was really cool. And you could eventually, if you were not happy, chances were very high that you could, say, fix it either with the tweak tool or with the uh, extensions, uh, with the extensions website. So when we talk about evolving GNOME, we might want to have some numbers as well. And from the initial release to the latest release, uh, roughly 1,800 days have been, uh, have passed since then. And we've made uh, 350,000 plus changes, or not plus, but around 350,000 changes. So this is uh, uh, to say that we are not done yet. GNOME 3.0 is not GNOME 3, right? GNOME 3 is evolving, and GNOME 3 is trying to uh, refine with every release and try to uh, still make it better and easier for people to use. When we look at the release history, we can see that there has been a constant stream of releases. GNOME is, uh, or, uh, yeah, GNOME is one of the projects that uh, I claim has introduced the six-month release cycle and we've stick to that cycle for, for many releases now. And you can, if you build your product on GNOME technologies, you can uh, expect a new release of uh, the GNOME platform every, every uh, six months. We've started actually to, uh, to name the GNOME releases. So the, uh, the latest release, I think I, I mentioned Gothenburg earlier, right? that the latest release would have been named Gothenburg. I'm wrong. It's uh, called Delhi, of course, because uh, the latest uh, GNOME event was the GNOME Asia Summit in Delhi. And we now name the, the GNOME releases after the cities who are kindly, who are kind enough to, to host our annual or our, our GNOME events. So the next GNOME release will actually be called Karlsruhe, which is the place where the Guadec, again, will take place in mid of August. So this is, um, this is the history of uh, GNOME in general. Now let's, uh, I want to, to dip in to a few 
stories of change. So we, we know that or with 350,000 plus changes, we know that, well, the initial release had not been perfect yet. And well, as it is with, with software, it's, uh, it's very hard to come up with, with a perfect product. So there has been change. And one area of change is the story of contacts. So this is what it, what it looked like in the early 3.0 cycle. We had a relatively simple widget which did reasonably well what it was supposed to, namely display uh, people and allow them to, to edit basic things. And this was already good, but it had been made a bit more appealing, arguably at least, with the, uh, with the release following that. And it still allowed for more, say, things to change and for a more uh, uh, usable interface in the release following that. So the... Uh, what you can take away from that is that whenever you see things that you're not happy with, there is room for change. And it is not the case that you would be rejected with your idea right away. So instead of, well, because there had been the claim that, well, the GNOME people do not listen. Right? This is not necessarily true. The decision making and the, the way things are being designed and decided is relatively uh, open. It's the designing phase, for example, much of it takes place on the wiki. So if you follow the, the wiki pages for the relevant, uh, say, design concepts or for the, for the projects that you're interested in, you can indeed uh, influence the, the decision making and you can propose things or changes that you want to see. Likewise, context is probably uh, well, is, is one, uh, one instance of uh, how things have evolved over, over the course of uh, the time from you know, 3.0 to 3.20. Another story which I think is more interesting, because it's also more complicated, is the story of notifications. So notifications have always been a, well, a difficult task, because it's whenever there's a notification, a notification is potentially interrupting the user, right? And interrupting the user is not something, something uh, you should take lightly. So it's, uh, it's a bit tricky how to do that best because you have to, well, all somehow enable the user to not get interrupted. But then again, there's interruptions that you really do want the user to pre present with. So it's a, it's a non-trivial task to deliver or to, to create a system uh, in which your applications can create and deliver notifications uh, nicely. So the first notifications uh, or notification system looked something like this, which is the traditional uh, libnotify-based notifications, uh, similar to what Windows had done also, except that we started to make them uh, more interactive, right? So this is... Uh, the integrated messaging stuff where you could type things into the notifications themselves. Do you, um, am I, do I have to? Okay. Oh, am I? But I had an hour, didn't I? No. Oh. Oops. <laughs> okay. Um, well, <it's> a <laughs> I really thought I had an hour. Jesus. <laughs> okay. So, um, notifications is initial, initial version. We made them more interactive uh, with uh, actual buttons, and uh, we redesigned the, the visuals around the notifications, and it was still, the system was still a bit ugly until it uh, was redesigned completely to make it uh, more central, to, to have them have the notifications in a more central place. And, uh, well, this will hopefully mm, make it more discoverable whenever you have notifications and how to deal with them. So, uh, with that, uh, I'm being kicked off the stage. So, uh, I'll, I'll take questions just outside in the, in the nice sun. I'll thank you very much for your attention.